Chapter 1 of the Coxon Fund. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Kaplan. The Coxon Fund by Henry James. Chapter 1. They've got him for life, I said to myself that evening on my way back to the station. But later on, alone in the compartment, from Wimbledon to Waterloo before the glory of the district railway, I amended this declaration in the light of the sense that my friends would probably, after all, not enjoy a monopoly of Mr. Saltram. I won't pretend to have taken his vast measure on that first occasion, but I think I had achieved a glimpse of what the privilege of his acquaintance might mean for many persons in the way of charges accepted. He had been a great experience, and it was this, perhaps, that had put me into the frame of foreseeing how we should all, sooner or later, have the honor of dealing with him as a whole. Whatever impression I then received of the amount of this total, I had a full enough vision of the patience of the Mulvilles. He was to stay all the winter. Adelaide dropped it in a tone that drew the sting from the inevitable emphasis. These excellent people might indeed have been content to give the circle of hospitality a diameter of six months, but if they didn't say he was to stay all summer, as well it was only because this was more than they had ventured to hope. I remember that at dinner that evening he wore slippers, new and predominantly purple, of some queer carpet stuff, but the Mulvilles were still in the stage of supposing that he might be snatched from them by higher bidders. At a later time they grew, poor dears, to fear no snatching, but theirs was a fidelity which needed no help from competition to make them proud. Wonderful indeed as, when all was said, you inevitably pronounced Frank Saltram, it was not to be overlooked that the Kent Mulvilles were in their way still more extraordinary, as striking an instance as could easily be encountered of the familiar truth that remarkable men find remarkable conveniences. They had sent for me from Wimbledon to come out and dine, and there had been an implication in Adelaide's note, judged by her notes alone she might have been thought silly, that it was a case in which something momentous was to be determined or done. I had never known them not to be in a state about somebody, and I dare say I tried to be droll on this point in accepting their invitation. On finding myself in the presence of the latest discovery, I had not at first felt the reverence droop, and, thank heaven, I have never been absolutely deprived of that alternative in Mr. Saltron's company. I saw, however, I hasten to declare it, that compared this specimen, their other phoenixes had been birds of inconsiderable feather, and I afterwards took credit to myself for not having even in primal bewilderments made a mistake about the essence of the man. He had an incomparable gift. I never was blind to it. It dazzles me still. It dazzled me perhaps even more in remembrance than in fact, for I'm not underware that for so rare a subject the imagination goes to some expense, inserting a jewel here and there or giving a twist to a plume. How the art of portraiture would rejoice in this figure if the art of portraiture had only the canvas. Nature, in truth, had largely rounded it, and if memory, hovering about it, sometimes holds her breath, this is because the voice that comes back was really golden. Though the great man was an inmate and didn't dress, he kept dinner on this occasion waiting, and the first words he uttered on coming into the room were an elated announcement to Mulva that he had found out something. Not catching the illusion and gaping doubtless a little at his face, I privately asked Adelaide what he had found out. I shall never forget the look she gave me as she replied, Everything! She really believed it. At that moment, at any rate, he had found out that the mercy of the Mulvilles was infinite. He had previously, of course, discovered, as I had myself for that matter, that their dinners were soignées. Let me not indeed, in saying this, neglect to declare that I shall falsify my counterfeit if I seem to hint that there was in his nature any ounce of calculation. He took whatever came, but he never plotted for it and no man who was so much of an absorbent can ever have been so little of a parasite. He had a system of the universe, but he had no system of sponging. That was quite hand-to-mouth. 
He had fine, gross, easy senses, but it was not his good-natured appetite that wrought confusion. If he had loved us for our dinners, we could have paid with our dinners, and it would have been a great economy of finer matter. I make free in these connections with the plural possessive, because if I was never able to do what the Mulvilles did, and people with still bigger houses and simpler charities, I met first and last every demand of reflection, of emotion, particularly perhaps those of gratitude and of resentment. No one, I think, paid the tribute of giving him up so often, and if it's rendering honor to borrow wisdom, I have a right to talk of my sacrifices. He yielded lessons as the sea yields fish. I lived for a while on this diet. Sometimes it almost appeared to me that his massive monstrous failure, if failure after all it was, had been designed for my private recreation. It really pampered my curiosity, but the history of that experience would take me too far. This is not the large canvas I just now spoke of, and I wouldn't have been approached him with my present hand had it been a question of all the features. Frank Saltram's features, for artistic purposes, are verily the anecdotes that are to be gathered. Their name is Legion, and this is only one, of which the interest is that it concerns even more closely several other persons. Such episodes, as one looks back, are the little dramas that made up the innumerable facets of the big drama, which is yet to be recorded. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of The Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Doralene Kaplan. It is furthermore remarkable that though the two stories are distinct, my own, as it were, and this other, they equally began in a manner the first night of my acquaintance with Frank Saltram, the night I came back from Wimbledon, so agitated with a new sense of life that in London, for the very thrill of it, I could only walk home. Walking and swinging my stick, I overtook at Buckingham Gate George Gravener, and George Gravener's story may be said to have begun with my making him, as our paths lay together, come home with me for a talk. I duly remember, let me parenthesize, that it was still more that of another person, and also that several years were to elapse before it was to extend to a second chapter. I had much to say to him, nonetheless, about my visit to the Mulvilles, whom he more indifferently knew, and I was at any rate so amusing that for long afterwards he never encountered me without asking for news of the old man of the sea. I hadn't said Mr. Saltram was old, and it was to be seen that he was of an age to outweather George Gravener, I had at that time a lodging in Ebury Street, and Gravener was staying at his brother's empty house in Eaton Square. At Cambridge, five years before, even in our devastating set, his intellectual power had seemed to me almost awful. Someone had once asked me privately, with blanched cheeks, what it was then that after all such a mind as that left standing. It leaves itself. I could recollect devoutly replying. I could smile at present for this remembrance, since before we got to Ebury Street I was struck with the fact that save in the sense of being well set up on his legs, George Gravener had actually ceased to tower. The universe he laid low had somehow bloomed again. The usual eminences were visible. I wondered whether he had lost his humor, or only dreadful thought, had never had any, not even when I had fancied him most Aristophanesque. What was the need of appealing to laughter, however, I could enviously inquire, where you might appeal so confidently to measurement? Mr. Saltram's queer figure, his thick nose and hanging lip, were fresh to me. In the light of my old friend's fine, cold symmetry, they presented mere success and amusing as the refuge of conscious ugliness. Already, at hungry twenty-six, Gravener looked as blank and parliamentary as if he were fifty and popular. In my scrap of a residence, he had a worldling's eye for its futile conveniences, but never a comrade's joke. I sounded Frank Saltram in his ears.
a circumstance I mention in order to note that even then I was surprised at his impatience of my enlivenment. As he had never before heard of the personage, it took indeed the form of impatience of the preposterous Mulvilles, his relation to whom, like mine, had had its origin in an early, a childish intimacy with the young Adelaide, the fruit of multiplied ties in the previous generation. When she married Kent Mulville, who was older than Gravener and I, and much more amiable, I gained a friend. But Gravener practically lost one. We reacted in different ways from the form taken by what he called their deplorable social action. The form, the term was also his, of nasty second-rate gush. I may have held in my four interior that the good people at Wimbledon were beautiful fools, but when he sniffed at them, I couldn't help taking the opposite line, for I already felt that even should we happen to agree, it would always be for reasons that differed. It came home to me that he was admirably British as, without so much as a social sneer at my bookbinder, he turned away from the serried rows of my little French library. Of course, I've never seen the fellow, but it's clear enough he's a humbug. Clear enough is just what it isn't, I replied. If it only were. That ejaculation on my part must have been the beginning of a, what was to later be a long ache for final frivolous rest. Gravener was profound enough to remark after a moment that in the first place he couldn't be anything but a dissenter and when I answered that the very note of his fascination was his extraordinary speculative breath, my friend retorted that there was no cad like your cultivated cad, and that I might depend upon discovering, since I had had the levity not already to have inquired, that my shining light proceeded a generation back from a Methodist cheesemonger. I confess I was struck with his insistence, and I said after reflection, if it may be, I admit it may be, but why on earth are you so sure? Asking the question mainly to lay him the trap of saying that it was because the poor man didn't dress for dinner. He took an instant to circumvent my trap and come blandly out the other side. Because the Kent Mulvilles have invented him. They've an infallible hand for frauds, all their geese are swans. They were born to be duped, they like it, they cry for it. They don't know anything from anything, and they disgust one, luckily, perhaps, with Christian charity. His vehemence was doubtless an accident, but might have been a strange foreknowledge. I forget what protest I dropped. It was only, at any rate, something that led him to go on after a moment. I only ask one thing. It's perfectly simple. Is a man, in a given case, a real gentleman? A real gentleman, my dear fellow, that's so soon said. If they've got hold of one this time, he must be a great rascal. I might feel injured, I answered, if I didn't reflect that they don't rave about me. Don't be too sure. I'll grant that he's a gentleman. Gravener presently added, If you'll admit that he's a scamp. I don't know which to admire most, your logic or your benevolence. My friend colored at this, but he didn't change the subject. Where did they pick him up? I think they were struck with something he had published. I can fancy the dreary thing. I believe they found out he had all sorts of worries and difficulties. That, of course, wasn't to be endured, so they jumped at the privilege of paying his debts. I profess that I knew nothing about his debts, and I reminded my visitor that though the dear Mulvilles were angels, they were neither idiots nor millionaires. What they mainly aimed at was reuniting Mr. Saltram to his wife. I was expecting to hear he has basely abandoned her, Gravener went on at this. And I'm too glad you don't disappoint me. I tried to recall exactly what Mrs. Mulville had told me. He didn't leave her, no. It's she who has left him. Left him to us? Gravener asked. The monster, many thanks. I decline to take him. You'll hear more about him in spite of yourself. I can't, no, I really can't resist the impression that he's a big man. I was already mastering to my shame, perhaps be it said, just the tone my old friend least liked. It's doubtless only a trifle, he returned. But you haven't happened to mention what his reputation's to rest on. Why on what I began by boring you with his extraordinary mind? 
as exhibited in his writings possibly in his writings but certainly in his talk which is far and away the richest i have ever listened to and what's it all about my dear fellow don't ask me about everything i pursued reminding myself of poor adelaide about his idea of things i then more charitably added you must have heard him to know what i mean it's unlike anything that ever was heard i colored i admit i overcharged a little for such a picture was an anticipation of Saltram's later development, and still more of my fuller acquaintance with him. However, I really expressed, a little lyrically perhaps, my actual imagination of him, when I proceeded to declare that, in a cloud of tradition, of legend, he might very well go down to posterity as the greatest of all great talkers. Before we parted, George Gravener had wondered why such a row should have been made about a chatterbox, the more and why he should be pampered and pensioned. The greater the windbag, the greater the calamity. Out of proportion to everything else on earth had come to be this wagging of the tongue. We were drenched with talk. Our wretched age was dying of it. I differed from him here sincerely, only going so far as to concede, and gladly, that we were drenched with sound. It was not, however, the mere speakers who were killing us. It was the mere stammerers. Fine talk was as rare as it was refreshing. The gift of the gods themselves, the one starry spangle on the ragged cloak of humanity. How many men were there who rose to this privilege? Of how many masters of conversation could he boast the acquaintance? Dying of talk? Why, we were dying of the lack of it. Bad writing wasn't talk, as many people seem to think, and even good wasn't always to be compared to it. From the best talk, indeed, the best writing had something to learn. I fancifully added that we should peradventure be gilded by the legend, should be pointed at for having listened, for having actually heard. Gravener, who had glanced at his watch and discovered it was midnight, found to all this a retort beautifully characteristic of him. There's one little fact to be borne in mind in the presence of equally of the best talk and of the worst. He looked in saying this as if he meant great things, and I was sure he could only mean once more that neither of them mattered if a man wasn't a real gentleman. Perhaps it was what he did mean. He deprived me, however, of the exultation of being right by putting the truth in a slightly different way. The only thing that really counts for one's estimate of a person is his conduct. He had his watch still in his palm, and I reproached him with unfair play in having ascertained beforehand that it was now the hour at which I always gave in. My pleasantry so far failed to mollify him, that he promptly added that to the rule he had just enunciated there was absolutely no exception none whatever none whatever trust me then to try to be good at any price i laughed as i went with him to the door i declare i will be if i have to be horrible end of chapter two recording by doralene kaplan chapter three of the coxon fund by henry james this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Kaplan. If that first night was one of the liveliest, or at any rate was the freshest of my exaltations, there was another, four years later, that was one of my great discomposures. Repetition, I well knew by this time, was the secret of Saltron's power to alienate. And, of course, one would never have seen him at his finest if one hadn't seen him in his remorses. They sent in mainly at this season and were magnificent, elemental, orchestral. I was quite aware that one of these atmospheric disturbances was now due, but nonetheless, in our arduous attempt to set him on his feet as a lecturer, it was impossible not to feel that two failures were a large order, as we said, for a short course of five. This was the second time, and it was past nine o'clock. The audience, a muster unprecedented and really encouraging, had fortunately the attitude of blandness that might have been looked for in persons whom the promise of, 
if I'm not mistaken, an analysis of primary ideas had drawn to the neighborhood of Upper Baker Street. There was in those days in that region a petty lecture hall to be secured on terms as moderate as the funds left at our disposal by the irrepressible question of the maintenance of five small saltrams. I include the mother, and one large one. By the time the saltrams of different sizes were all maintained, we had pretty well poured out the oil that might have lubricated the machinery for enabling the most original of men to appear to maintain them. It was I, the other time, who had been forced into the breach, standing up there for an odious lamplit moment, to explain to half a dozen thin benches, where earnest brows were virtuously void of anything so cynical as a suspicion, that we couldn't so much as put our finger on Mr. Saltram. There was nothing to plead but that our scouts had been out from the early hours, and that we were afraid that on one of his walks abroad, he took one for meditation, whenever he was to address such a company, some accident has disabled or delayed him. The meditative walks were a fiction, for he never, that anyone could discover, prepared anything but a magnificent prospectus. Hence his circulars and programs, of which I possess an almost complete collection, are the solemn ghosts of generations never born. I put the case, as it seemed to me, at the best, but I admit I had been pretty angry, and Kent Mulville was shocked at the want of public optimism. This time, therefore, I left the excuses to his more practiced patience, only relieving myself in response to a direct appeal from a young lady, next whom in the hall I found myself sitting. My position was an accident, but if it had been calculated, the reason would scarce have eluded an observer of the fact that no one else in the room had an approach to an appearance. Our philosopher's tail was deplorably limp. This visitor was the only person who looked at her ease, who had come a little in the spirit of adventure. She seemed to carry amusement in her handsome young head, and her presence spoke, a little mystifyingly, of a sudden extension of Saltram's sphere of influence. He was doing better than we hoped, and he had chosen such an occasion, of all occasions, to succumb to heaven knew which of his fond infirmities. The young lady produced an impression of auburn hair and black velvet, and had on her other hand a companion of obscure type, presumably a waiting maid. She herself might perhaps have been a foreign countess, and before she addressed me I had beguiled our sorry interval by finding in her a vague recall of the opening of some novel of Madame Sand. It didn't make her more fathomable to pass in a few minutes from this to the certitude that she was American. It simply engendered depressing reflections as to the possible check to contributions from Boston. She asked me if, as a person, apparently more initiated, I would recommend further waiting, and I answered that if she considered I was on my honor, I would privately deprecate it. Perhaps she didn't, at any rate, or taught took a turn that prolonged it till she became aware we were left almost alone. I presently ascertained she knew Mrs. Salter, and this explained in a manner the miracle. The brotherhood of the friends of the husband was as nothing to the brotherhood, or perhaps I should say the sisterhood, of the friends of the wife. Like the Kent Mulvilles, I belonged to both fraternities, and even better than they I think I had sounded the abyss of Mrs. Saltram's wrongs. She bored me to extinction, and I knew but too well how she had bored her husband. But there were those who stood by her, the most efficient of whom were indeed the handful of poor Saltram's backers. They did her liberal justice, whereas her mere patrons and partisans had nothing but hatred for our philosopher. I'm bound to say it was we, however, we of both camps, as it were, who had always done most for her. I thought my young lady looked rich, I scarcely knew why, and I hoped she had put her hand in a pocket. I soon made her out, however, not at all a fine fanatic. She was but a generous, irresponsible inquirer. She had come to England to see her aunt, and it was at her aunt's she had met the dreary lady we had all so much on our mind. I saw she'd helped to pass the time when she observed that it was a pity this lady wasn't intrinsically more interesting. That was refreshing, for it was an article of faith in Mrs. Saltram's circle, at least among those who scorned to know her hard husband, that she was attractive on her merits. She was in truth a most ordinary person, as Saltram himself would have been if he hadn't been a prodigy. The question of vulgarity had no application to him, but it was a measure his wife kept challenging you to apply. 
I hasten to add that the consequences of your doing so were no sufficient reason for his having left her to starve. He doesn't seem to have much force of character, said my young lady, at which I laughed out so loud that my departing friends looked back at me over their shoulders as if I were making a joke of their discomfiture. My joke probably cost Saltram a subscription or two, but it helped me on with my interlocutor tress. She says he drinks like a fish, she sociably continued, and yet she allows that his mind's wonderfully clear. It was amusing to converse with a pretty girl who could talk of the clearness of Saltram's mind. I expected next to hear she had been assured he was awfully clever. I tried to tell her, I had it almost on my conscience, what was the proper way to regard him, an effort attended perhaps more than ever on this occasion with the usual effect of my feeling that I wasn't, after all, very sure of it. She had come tonight out of high curiosity. She had wanted to learn this proper way for herself. She had read some of his papers and hadn't understood them, but it was at home, at her aunt's, that her curiosity had been kindled. Kindled mainly by his wife's remarkable stories of his want of virtue. I suppose they ought to have kept me away. My companion dropped. And I suppose they'd have done so if I hadn't somehow got an idea that he's fascinating. In fact, Mrs. Saltram herself says he is. So you came to see where the fascination resides. Well, you've seen. My young lady raised fine eyebrows. Do you mean in his bad faith? In the extraordinary effects of it, his possession, that is, of some quality or other that condemns us in advance to forgive him the humiliation, as I may call it, to which he has subjected us. The humiliation? Why, mine, for instance, as one of his guarantors, before you as the purchaser of a ticket. She let her charming gay eyes rest on me. You don't look humiliated a bit, and if you did, I should let you off, disappointed as I am, for the mysterious quality you speak of is just the quality I came to see. Oh, you can't see it, I cried. How then do you get at it? You don't. You mustn't suppose he's good-looking, I added. Why, his wife says he's lovely. My hilarity may have struck her as excessive, but I confess it broke out afresh. Had she acted only in obedience to this singular plea so characteristic on Mrs. Saltram's part of what was irritating in the narrowness of that lady's point of view, Mrs. Saltram, I explained, undervalues him where he's strongest, so that, to make up for it, perhaps, she overpraises him where he's weak. He's not assuredly superficially attractive. He's middle-aged, fat, featureless, save for his great eyes. Yes, his great eyes, said my young lady attentively. She had evidently heard all about his great eyes, the beau yeux, for which alone we had really done it all. They're tragic and splendid, lights on a dangerous coast. But he moves badly and dresses worse, and altogether he's anything but smart. My companion, who appeared to reflect on this after a moment, appealed. Do you call him a real gentleman? I started slightly at the question, for I had a sense of recognizing it. George Gravener, years before, that first flush night, had put me face to face with it. It had embarrassed me then, but it didn't embarrass me now, for I had lived with it and overcome it and disposed of it. A real gentleman? Emphatically not. My promptitude surprised her a little but I quickly felt how little it was to Gravener I was now talking. Do you say that because he's, what do you call it in England, of humble extraction? Not a bit. His father was a country schoolmaster, and his mother the widow of a sexton. But that has nothing to do with it. I say it simply because I know him well. But isn't it an awful drawback? Awful. Quite awful. I mean, isn't it positively fatal? Fatal to what? Not to his magnificent vitality. Again, she had a meditative moment. And is his magnificent vitality the cause of his vices? Your questions are formidable, but I'm glad you put them. I was thinking of his noble intellect. His vices, as you say, have been much exaggerated. They consist mainly, after all, in one comprehensive defect. A want of will? A want of dignity. He doesn't recognize his obligations? On the contrary, he recognizes them with effusion, especially in public. 
he smiles and bows and beckons across the street to them, but when they pass over he turns away, and he speedily loses them in the crowd. The recognition's purely spiritual. It isn't in the least social, so he leaves all his belongings to other people to take care of. He accepts favors, loans, sacrifices, all with nothing more deterrent than an agony of shame. Fortunately, we're a little faithful band, and we do what we can. I held my tongue about the natural children, engendered to the number of three in the wantonness of his youth. I only remarked that he did make efforts, often tremendous ones. But the efforts, I said, never come to much. The only things that come to much are the abandonments, the surrenders. And how much do they come to? You're right to put it as if we had a big bill to pay. But, as I've told you before, your questions are rather terrible. They come, these mere exercises of genius, to a great sum total of poetry, of philosophy, a mighty mass of speculation, notation, quotation. The genius is there, you see, to meet the surrender, but there's no genius to support the defenses. But what is there, after all, at his age to show? In the way of achievement recognized and reputation established, I asked. To show, if you will, there isn't much, since his writing mostly isn't as fine, isn't certainly as showy as his talk. Moreover, two-thirds of his work are merely colossal projects and announcements. Showing, Frank Saltram, is often a poor business, I went on. We endeavored, you'll have observed, to show him tonight. However, if he had lectured, he'd have lectured divinely. It would just have been his talk. And what would his talk just have been? I was conscious of some ineffectiveness, as well, perhaps, of a little impatience, as I replied, the exhibition of a splendid intellect. My young lady looked not quite satisfied at this, but as I wasn't prepared for another question, I hastily pursued the sight of a great suspended swinging crystal, huge, lucid, lustrous, a block of light, flashing back every impression of life and every possibility of thought. This gave her something to turn over till we had passed out to the dusky porch of the hall, in front of which the lamps of a quiet brougham were almost the only thing Saltram's treachery hadn't extinguished. I went with her to the door of her carriage, out of which she leaned a moment after she had thanked me and taken her seat. Her smile, even in the darkness, was pretty. I do want to see that crystal. You've only to come to the next lecture. I go abroad in a day or two with my aunt. Wait over till next week, I suggested. It's quite worth it. She became grave. Not unless he really comes. At which the brougham started off, carrying her away too fast, fortunately for my manners, to allow me to exclaim ingratitude. End of chapter 3. Recording by Larry Kaplan. Chapter 4 of The Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Doralene Kaplan. Mrs. Saltram made a great affair of her right to be informed where her husband had been the second evening he failed to meet his audience. She came to me to ascertain, but I couldn't satisfy her, for in spite of my ingenuity, I remained in ignorance. It wasn't till much later that I found this had not been the case with Kent Mulville, whose hope for the best never twirled the thumbs of him more placidly than when he happened to know the worst. He had known it on the occasion I speak of, that is, immediately after. He was impenetrable then, but ultimately confessed. What he confessed was more than I shall now venture to make public. It was, of course familiar to me that Saltram was incapable of keeping the engagements which, after their separation, he had entered into with regard to his wife, a deeply wronged, justly resentful, quite irreproachable and insufferable person. She often appeared at my chambers to talk over his lapses, for if, as she declared, she had washed her hands of him, she had carefully preserved the water of this ablution, which he handed about for analysis. She had arts of her own of exciting one's impatience, the most infallible of which was perhaps her assumption that we were kind to her because we liked her. 
In reality, her personal fall had been a sort of social rise, since I had seen the moment when, in our little conscientious circle, her desolation almost made her the fashion. Her voice was grating, and her children ugly. Moreover, she hated the good Mulvilles, whom I more and more loved. They were the people who, by doing most for her husband, had in the long run done most for herself, and the warm confidence with which he had laid his length upon them was a pressure gentle compared with her stiffer persuadability. I'm bound to say he didn't criticize his benefactors, though practically he got tired of them. She, however, had the highest standards about alimocinary reforms. She offered the odd spectacle of a spirit puffed up by dependence, and indeed it had introduced her to some excellent society. She pitied me for not knowing certain people who aided her, and whom she doubtless patronized in turn for their luck in not knowing me. I dare say I should have got on with her better if she had had a ray of imagination, if it had occasionally seemed to occur to her to regard Saltram's expressions of his nature in any other manner than as separate subjects of woe. They were all flowers of his character, pearls strung on an endless thread, but she had a stubborn little way of challenging them one after the other, as if she never suspected that he had a character, such as it was, or that deficiencies might be organic, the irritating effect of a mind incapable of a generalization. One might doubtless have overdone the idea that there was a general license for such a man, but if this had happened, it would have been through one's feeling that there could be none for such a woman. I recognized her superiority when I asked her about the aunt of the disappointed young lady. It sounded like a sentence from an English, French, or other phrase book. She triumphed in what she told me, and she may have triumphed still more in what she withheld. My friend of the other evening, Miss Anvoy, had but lately come to England. Lady Coxon, the aunt, had been established here for years in consequence of her marriage with the late Sir Gregory of that name. She had a house in the Regent's Park, a bath chair, and a fernery, and above all she had sympathy. Mrs. Saltram had made her acquaintance through mutual friends. This vagueness caused me to feel how much I was out of it, and how large an independent circle Mrs. Saltram had at her command. I should have been glad to know more about the disappointed young lady, but I felt I should know most by not depriving her of her advantage, as she might have mysterious means of depriving me of my knowledge. For the present, moreover, this experience was stayed, Lady Coxon having in fact gone abroad accompanied by her niece. The niece, besides being immensely clever, was an heiress, Mrs. Saltram said, the only daughter and the light of the eyes of some great American merchant, a man over there of endless indulgences and dollars. She had pretty clothes and pretty manners, and she had, what was prettier still, the great thing of all. The great thing of all for Mrs. Saltram was always sympathy, and she spoke as if during the absence of these ladies she mightn't know where to turn for it. A few months later, indeed, when they had come back, her tone perceptibly changed. She alluded to them, on my leading her up to it, rather as to persons in her debt for favors received. What had happened I didn't know, but I saw it would take only a little bit more or a little less to make her speak of them as thankless subjects of social countenance, people for whom she had vainly tried to do something. I confess I saw how it wouldn't be in a mere week or two that I should rid myself of the image of Ruth Anvoy, in whose very name, when I learnt it, I found something secretly to like. I should probably neither see her nor hear of her again. The knight's widow, he had been mayor of Clockborough, would pass away and the heiress would return to her inheritance. I gathered with surprise 
that she had not communicated to his wife the story of her attempt to hear Mr. Saltram, and I found this reticence on the easy supposition that Mrs. Saltram had fatigued by overpressure the spring of the sympathy of which she boasted. The girl, at any rate, would forget the small adventure, be distracted, take a husband, besides which she would lack occasion to repeat her experiment. We clung to the idea of the brilliant course, delivered without an accident, that, as a lecturer, would still make the paying public aware of our great man. But the fact remained that in the case of an inspiration so unequal, there was treachery. There was fallacy, at least, in the very conception of a series. In our scrutiny of ways and means, we were inevitably subject to the old convention of the synopsis, the syllabus partly, of course, not to lose the advantage of his grand free hand in drawing up such things, but for myself, I laughed at our playbills even while I stickled for them. It was indeed amusing work to be scrupulous for Frank Saltram, who also at moments laughed about it, so far as the comfort of a sigh so unstudied as to be cheerful might pass for such a sound. He admitted with a candor, all his own, that he was in truth only to be depended on in the Mulvilles drawing room. Yes, he suggestively allowed. It's there, I think, that I'm at my best, quite late when it gets toward eleven, and if I've not been too much worried. We all knew what too much worry meant. It meant too enslaved for the hour to the superstition of sobriety. On the Saturdays I used to bring my portmanteau, so as not to have to think of eleven o'clock trains. I had a bold theory that as regards this temple of talk and its altars of cushioned chintz, its pictures and its flowers, its large fireside and clear lamplight, we might really arrive at something if the Mulvilles would but charge for admission. Here it was, however, that they shamelessly broke down. As there's a flaw in every perfection, this was the inexpugnable refuge of their egotism. They declined to make their saloon a market, so that Saltram's golden words continued the sole coin that rang there. It can have happened to no man, however, to be paid a greater price than such an enchanted hush as surrounded him on his greatest nights. The most profane on these occasions felt a presence all minor eloquence grew dumb. Adelaide Mulville, for the pride of her hospitality, anxiously watched the door or stealthily poked the fire. I used to call it the music room, for we had anticipated Bayreuth. The very gates of the kingdom of light seemed to open and the horizon of thought to flash with the beauty of a sunrise at sea. In the consideration of ways and means, the sittings of our little board, we were always conscious of the creak of Mrs. Saltram's shoes. She hovered, she interrupted, she almost presided at the state of affairs being mostly such as to supply her with every incentive for inquiring what was to be done next. It was the pressing pursuit of this knowledge that, in concatenations of omnibuses and usually in very wet weather, led her so often to my door. She thought us spiritless creatures with editors and publishers, but she carried matters to no great effect when she personally pushed into back shops. She wanted all monies to be paid to herself. They were otherwise liable to such strange adventures. They trickled away into the desert. They were mainly at best, alas, a slender stream. The editors and the publishers were the last people to take this remarkable thinker at the valuation that has now pretty well come to be established. The former were half distraught between the desire to cut him and the difficulty of finding a crevice for their shears, and when a volume on this or that portentous subject was proposed to the latter, they suggested alternative titles which, as reported to our friend, brought into his face the noble blank melancholy that sometimes made it handsome. The title of an unwritten book didn't after all much matter, but some masterpiece of Saltram's may have died in his bosom 
of the shudder with which it was then convulsed. The ideal solution, failing the fee at Kent Mulville's door, would have been some system of subscription to projected treatises with their non-appearance provided for, provided for, I mean, by the indulgence of subscribers. The author's real misfortune was that subscribers were so wretchedly literal. When they tastelessly inquired why publication hadn't ensued, I was tempted to ask who in the world had ever been so published. Nature herself had brought him out in voluminous form, and the money was simply a deposit on borrowing the work. End of chapter 4 Recording by Doralee Kaplan Chapter 5 of the Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Kaplan. I was doubtless often a nuisance to my friends in those years, but there were sacrifices I declined to make, and I never passed the hat to George Gravener. I never forgot our little discussion in Ebury Street, and I think it stuck in my throat to have to treat him to the avowal I had found so easy to Miss Anvoy. It had cost me nothing to confide to this charming girl, but it would have cost me much to confide to the friend of my youth that the character of the real gentleman wasn't an attribute of the man I took such pains for. Was this because I had already generalized to the point of perceiving that women are really the unfastidious sex? I knew at any rate that Gravener, already quite in view but still hungry and frugal, had naturally enough more ambition than charity. He had sharp aims for stray sovereigns, being in view most from the tall steeple of Clockborough. His immediate ambition was to occupy, en Louis soul, the field of vision of that smokily seeing city, and all his movements and postures were calculated for the favoring angle. The movement of the hand as to the pocket had thus to alternate gracefully with the posture of the hand on the heart. He talked to Clockborough in short only less beguilingly than Frank Saltram talked to his electors, with a difference to our credit, however, that we had already voted, and that our candidate had no antagonist but himself. He had more than once been at Wimbledon. It was Mrs. Mulville's work, not mine, and by the time the claret was served had seen the god descend. He took more pains to swing his censer than I had expected, but on our way back to town he forestalled any little triumph I might have been so artless as to express by the observation that such a man was, a hundred times, a man to use and never a man to be used by. I remember that this neat remark humiliated me almost as much as if I virtually, in the fever of broken slumbers, I hadn't often made it myself. The difference was that on Gravener's part a force attached to it that could never attach to it on mine. He was able to use people. He had the machinery, and the irony of Saltram's being made showy at Clockborough came out to me when he said, as if he had no memory of our original talk and the idea were quite fresh to him, I hate his type, you know, but I'll be hanged if I don't put some of those things in. I can find a place for them. We might even find a place for the fellow himself. I myself should have had some fear, not... I need scarcely say for the things themselves, but for some other things very near them, and fine for the rest of my eloquence. Later on I could see that the oracle of Wimbledon was not in this case so appropriate as he would have been had the polities of the gods only coincided more exactly with those of the party. There was a distinct moment when, without saying anything more definite to me, Gravener entertained the idea of annexing Mr. Saltram. Such a project was delusive for the discovery of analogies between his body of doctrine and that press from headquarters upon Clockborough, the bottling, in a word, of the air of those lungs for convenient public uncorking and corn exchanges, was an experiment for which no one had the leisure. The only thing would have been to carry him massively about, paid, caged, clipped, to turn him on for a particular occasion in a particular channel. Frank Saltram's channel, however, was essentially not calculable, and there was no knowing what disastrous floods might have ensued. For what there would have been to do, the Empire, the great newspaper, was there to look to, 
but it was no new misfortune that there were delicate situations in which the empire broke down. In fine, there was an instinctive apprehension that a clever young journalist, commissioned to report on Mr. Saltram, might never come back from the errand. No one knew better than George Gravener that that was a time when prompt returns counted double. If he therefore found our friend an exasperating waste of orthodoxy, it was because of his being, as he said, poor Gravener up in the clouds, not because he was down in the dust." The man would have been, just as he was, a real enough gentleman if he could have helped to put in a real gentleman. Gravener's great objection to the actual member was that he was not one. Lady Coxon had a fine old house, a house with grounds at Clockborough, which she had let. But after she returned from abroad I learned from Mrs. Saltram that the lease had fallen in and that she had gone down to resume possession. I could see the faded red livery the big square shoulders, the high wall garden of this decent abode. As the rumble of dissolution grew louder, the suitor would have pressed his suit, and I found myself hoping that the politics of the late mayor's widow wouldn't be such as to admonish her to ask him to dinner. Perhaps indeed I went so far as to pray they would naturally form a bar to any contact. I tried to focus the many button page in the daily airing, as he perhaps even pushed the bath chair over somebody's toes. I was destined to hear, none the less, through Mrs. Saltram, who, I afterwards learned, was in correspondence with Lady Coxon's housekeeper, that Gravener was known to have spoken of the habitation I had in my eye as the pleasantest thing in Clockborough. On his part, I was sure, this was the voice not of envy, but of experience. The vivid scene was now peopled, and I could see him in the old-time garden with Miss Anvoy, who would be certain, and very justly, to think him good-looking. It would be too much to describe myself as troubled by this play of surmise, but I occur to remember the relief, singular enough, of feeling it suddenly brushed away by an annoyance really much greater, an annoyance the result of its happening to come over me about that time with a rush that I was simply ashamed of Frank Saltram. There were limits, after all, and my mark at last had been reached. I had my disgust, if I may allow myself today such an expression, but this was a supreme revolt. Certain things cleared up in my mind, certain values stood out. It was all very well to have an unfortunate temperament. There was nothing so unfortunate as to have, for practical purposes, nothing else. I avoided George Gravener at this moment and reflected that at such a time I should do so most effectually by leaving England. I wanted to forget Frank Saltram. That was all. I didn't want to do anything in the world to him but that. Indignation had withered on the stalk, and I felt that one could pity him as much as one ought only by never thinking of him again. It wasn't for anything he had done to me. It was for what he had done to the Mulvilles. Adelaide cried about it for a week and her husband, profiting by the example so signally given him of the fatal effect of a want of character, left the letter, the drop too much, unanswered. The letter, an incredible one, addressed by Saltron to Wimbledon during a stay with the Pudneys at Ramsgate, was the central feature of the incident, which, however, had many features, each more painful than whichever other we compared it with. The Pudneys had behaved shockingly, but that was no excuse. Base ingratitude, gross indecency, one had one's choice only of such formulas as that the more they fitted, the less they gave one rest. These are dead aches now, and I am under no obligation, thank heaven, to be definite about the business. There are things which, if I had had to tell them, well, would have stopped me off here altogether. I went abroad for the general election, and if I don't know how much, on the continent I forgot, at least, how much I missed him. At a distance, in a foreign land, ignoring, abjuring, unlearning him, I discovered what he had done for me. I owed him, oh, unmistakably, certain noble conceptions. I had lighted my little taper at his smoky lamp, and lo, it continued to twinkle. But the light it gave me just showed me how much more I wanted. I was pursued, of course, by letters from Mrs. Saltram, which I didn't scruple not to read, though quite aware her embarrassments couldn't but be now of the gravest. I sacrificed the propriety by simply putting them away. 
And this is how, one day, as my absence drew to an end, my eye, while I rummaged in my desk for another paper, was caught by a name on a leaf that had detached itself from the packet. The allusion was to Miss Anvoy, who, it appeared, was engaged to be married to Mr. George Gravener, and the news was two months old. A direct question of Mrs. Saltram's had thus remained unanswered. She had inquired of me, in a postscript, what sort of man this aspirant to such a hand might be. The great other fact about him, just then, was that he had been triumphantly returned for Clockborough in the interest of the party that had swept the country, so that I might easily have referred Mrs. Saltram to the journals of the day. Yet when I at last wrote her that I was coming home and would discharge my accumulated burden by seeing her, I but remarked in regard to her question that she must really put it to Miss Anvoy. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Doraline Kaplan. I had almost avoided the general election, but some of its consequences on my return had smartly to be faced. The season in London began to breathe again and to flap its folded wings. Confidence under the new ministry was understood to be reviving and one of the symptoms in a social body was a recovery of appetite. People once more fed together, and it happened that one Saturday night at somebody's house I fed with George Gravener. When the ladies left the room, I moved up to where he sat and begged to congratulate him. On my election? He asked after a moment, so that I could feign jocosely not to have heard of that triumph and to be alluding to the rumor of a victory still more personal. I dare say I colored, however, for his political success had momentarily passed out of my mind. What was present to it was that he was to marry that beautiful girl, and yet his question made me conscious of some discomposure. I hadn't intended to put this before everything. He himself indeed ought gracefully to have done so, and I remember thinking the whole man was in this assumption that in expressing my sense of what he had won I had fixed my thoughts on his seat. We straightened the matter out, and he was so much lighter in hand then I had lately seen him that his spirits might well have been fed from a twofold source. He was so good as to say that he hoped I should soon make the acquaintance of Miss Anvoy, who, with her aunt, was presently coming up to town. Lady Coxon in the country had been seriously unwell, and this had delayed their arrival. I told them I had heard the marriage would be a splendid one, on which, brightened and humanized by his luck, he laughed and said, Do you mean for her? When I had again explained what I meant, he went on. Oh, she's an American, but you'd scarcely know it, unless perhaps, he added, by her being used to more money than most girls in England, even the daughters of rich men. That wouldn't in the least do for a fellow like me, you know, if it wasn't for the great liberality of a father. He really has been most kind, and everything's quite satisfactory. He added that his eldest brother had taken a tremendous fancy to her, and that during a recent visit at Coldfield, she had nearly won over Lady Maddock. I gathered from something he dropped later on that the free-handed gentleman beyond the seas had not made a settlement, but had given a handsome present, and was apparently to be looked to across the water for other favors. People are simplified alike by great contentments and great yearnings, and whether or no it was Gravener's directness that begot my own, I seem to recall that in some turn taken by our talk, he almost imposed it on me as an act of decorum to ask if Miss Anvoy had also by chance expectations from her aunt. My inquiry drew out that Lady Coxon, who was the oddest of women, would have in any contingency to act under her late husband's will, which was odder still, saddling her with a mass of queer obligations complicated with queer loopholes. There were several dreary people, Coxon cousins, old maids, to whom she would have more or less to minister. Gravener laughed, without saying no, when I suggested that the young lady might come in through a loophole, 
Then suddenly, as if he suspected my turning a lantern on him, he declared quite dryly, That's all rot. One's moved by other springs. A fortnight later, at Lady Coxon's own house, I understood well enough the springs one was moved by. Gravener had spoken of me there as an old friend, and I received a gracious invitation to dine. The knight's widow was again indisposed. She had succumbed at the eleventh hour, so that I found Miss Anvoy bravely playing hostess without even Gravener's help, since to make matters worse, he had just sent up word that the house, the insatiable house, with which he supposed he had contracted for easier terms, positively declined to release him. I was struck with the courage, the grace and gaiety of the young lady left thus to handle the fauna and flora of the Regent's Park. I did what I could to help her to classify them, after I had recovered from the confusion of seeing her slightly disconcerted at perceiving in the guest introduced by her intended the gentleman with whom she had had that talk about Frank Saltram. I had at this moment my first glimpse of the fact that she was a person who could carry a responsibility. But I leave the reader to judge of my sense of the aggravation, for either of us, of such a burden, when I heard the servant announce Mrs. Saltram. From what immediately passed between the two ladies, I gathered that the latter had been sent for post-haste to fill the gap created by the absence of the mistress of the house. Good! I remember crying. She'll be put by me! and my apprehension was promptly justified. Mrs. Saltram, taken in to dinner and taken in as a consequence of an appeal to her amiability, was Mrs. Saltram with a vengeance. I asked myself what Miss Anvoy meant by doing such things, but the only answer I arrived at was that Gravener was verily fortunate. She hadn't happened to tell him of her visit to Upper Baker Street, but she'd certainly tell him tomorrow. Not indeed that this would make him like any better her having had the innocence to invite such a person as Mrs. Saltram on such an occasion. It could only strike me that I had never seen a young woman put such ignorance into her cleverness, such freedom into her modesty. This, I think, was when, after dinner, she said to me frankly, with almost jubilant mirth, "'Oh, you don't admire Mrs. Saltram?' Why should I? This was truly a young person without guile. I had briefly to consider before I could reply that my objection to the lady named was the objection often uttered about people met at the social board. I knew all her stories. Then, as Miss Anvoy remained momentarily vague, I added, Those about her husband. Oh, yes, but there are some new ones. None for me. Ah, novelty would be pleasant. Uh, doesn't it appear that of late he has been particularly horrid? His fluctuations don't matter, I return. For at night all cats are gray. You saw the shade of this one the night we waited for him together. What will you have? He has no dignity. Miss Anvoy, who had been introducing with her American distinctness, looked encouragingly around at some of the combinations she had risked. It's too bad I can't see him. You mean Gravener won't let you? I haven't asked him. He lets me do everything. But you know he knows him and wonders what some of us see in him. We haven't happened to talk of him, the girl said. Get him to take you some day out to see the Mulvilles. I thought Mr. Saltram had thrown the Mulvilles over. Utterly. But that won't prevent his being planted there again to bloom like a rose within a month or two. Miss Anvoy thought a moment then. I should like to see them, she said with her fostering smile. They're tremendously worth it. You mustn't miss them. I'll make George take me, she went on as Mrs. Saltram came up to interrupt us. She sniffed at this unfortunate as kindly as she had smiled at me, and addressing the question to her continued, But the chance of a lecture, one of the wonderful lectures, isn't there another chorus announced? Another? There are about thirty, I exclaimed, turning away and feeling Mrs. Saltram's little eyes in my back. A few days after this, I heard that Gravener's marriage was near at hand, was settled for Whitsuntide, but as no invitation had reached me, 
I had my doubts, and there presently came to me, in fact, the report of a postponement. Something was the matter. What was the matter was supposed to be that Lady Coxon was now critically ill. I had called on her after my dinner in the Regent's Park, but I had neither seen her nor seen Miss Anvoy. I forget today the exact order in which at this period sundry incidents occurred and the particular stage at which it suddenly struck me, making me catch my breath a little, that the progression, the acceleration, was for all the world that of fine drama. This was probably rather late in the day and the exact order doesn't signify. What had already occurred was some accident determining a more patient wait. George Gravener, whom I met again, in fact told me as much, but without signs of perturbation. Lady Coxon had to be constantly attended to, and there were other good reasons as well. Lady Coxon had to be so constantly attended to that on the occasion of a second attempt in the Regent's Park, I equally failed to obtain a sight of her niece. I judged it discreet in all the conditions not to make a third, but this didn't matter, for it was through Adelaide Mulville that the side wind of the comedy, though I was at first unwitting, began to reach me. I went to Wimbledon at times because Saltram was there, and I went at others because he wasn't. The Pudneys, who had taken him to Birmingham, had already got rid of him, and we had a horrible consciousness of his wandering roofless, in dishonor, about the smoky Midlands, almost as the injured Lear wandered on the storm-lashed heath. His room upstairs had been lately done up. I could hear the crackle of the new chintz, and the difference only made his smirches and bruises, his splendid tainted genius, the more tragic. If he wasn't barefoot in the mire, he was sure to be unconventionally shod. These were the things Adelaide and I, who were old enough friends to stare at each other in silence, talked about when we didn't speak. When we spoke, it was only about the brilliant girl George Gravener was to marry, and whom he had brought out the other Sunday. I could see that this presentation had been happy, for Mrs. Mulville commemorated it after her sole fashion of showing confidence in a new relation. She likes me, she likes me. Her native humility exulted in that measure of success. We all knew for ourselves how she liked those who liked her, and as regards Ruth Anvoy, she was more easily won over than Lady Maddock. End of chapter 6 Recording by Doreen Kaplan Chapter 7 of The Coxon Fund by Henry James this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Kaplan. One of the consequences for the Mulvilles of the sacrifices they made for Frank Saltram was that they had to give up their carriage. Adelaide drove gently into London in a one-horse greenish thing, an early Victorian Landau hired, near at hand imaginatively, from a broken-down job master whose wife was in consumption a vehicle that made people turn round all the more when her pensioner sat beside her in a soft white hat and a shawl, one of the dear woman's own. This was his position, and I dare say his costume, when on an afternoon in July she went to return Miss Anvoy's visit. The wheel of fate had now revolved, and amid silences deep and exhaustive, compunctions and condonations alike unutterable, Saltram was reinstated. Was it in pride or in penance that Mrs. Mulville had begun immediately to drive him about? If he was ashamed of his ingratitude, she might have been ashamed of her forgiveness, but she was incorrigibly capable of liking him to be conspicuous in the Landau while she was in shops or with her acquaintance. However, if she was in the pillory for twenty minutes in the Regent's Park, I mean at Lady Coxon's door, while his companion paid her call, it wasn't to the further humiliation of any one concerned that she presently came out for him in person, not even to show either of them what a fool she was that she drew him in to be introduced to the bright young American. Her account of the introduction I had in its order, but before that, very late in the season, under Gravener's auspices, I met Miss Anvoy at tea at the House of Commons. The member for Clockborough had gathered a group of pretty ladies, and the Mulvilles were not of the party. On the great terrace, as I strolled off with her a little, the guest of honor immediately exclaimed to me, 
I've seen him, you know. I've seen him. She told me about Saltram's call. And how did you find him? Oh, so strange. You didn't like him? I can't tell till I see him again. You want to do that? She had a pause. Immensely. We went no further. I fancied she had become aware Gravener was looking at us. She turned back toward the knot of others, and I said, Dislike him as much as you will. I see you're bitten. Bitten? I thought she colored a little. Oh, it doesn't matter, I laughed. One doesn't die of it. I hope I shan't die of anything before I've seen more of Mrs. Mulville. I rejoiced with her over plain Adelaide, whom she pronounced the loveliest woman she had met in England. But before we separated, I remarked to her that it was an act of mere humanity to warn her that if she should see more of Frank Saltram, which would be likely to follow on any increase of acquaintance with Mrs. Mulville, she might find herself flattening her nose against the clear hard pain of an eternal question, that of the relative, that of the opposed importances of virtue and brains. She replied that this was surely a subject on which one took everything for granted, whereupon I admitted that I had perhaps expressed myself ill. What I referred to was what I had referred to the night we met in Upper Baker Street, the relative importance, relative to virtue, of other gifts. She asked me if I had called virtue a gift, a thing handed to us in a parcel on our first birthday. And I declared that this very inquiry proved to me the problem had already caught her by the skirt. She would have help, however, the same help I myself had once had, in resisting its tendency to make one cross. What help do you mean? That of the member for Clockborough. She stared, smiled, then returned. Why, my idea has been to help him. She had helped him. I had his own word for it that at Clockborough her bedevilment of the voters had really put him in. She would do so doubtless again and again, though I heard the very next month that this fine faculty had undergone a temporary eclipse. News of the catastrophe first came to me from Mrs. Saltram, and it was afterwards confirmed at Wimbledon. Poor Miss Anvoy was in trouble. Great disasters in America had suddenly summoned her home. Her father, in New York, had suffered reverses, lost so much money that it was really vexatious as showing how much he had had. It was Adelaide who told me she had gone off alone at less than a week's notice. Alone? Gravener has permitted that? What will you have? The House of Commons! I'm afraid I cursed the House of Commons. I was so much interested. Of course, he'd follow her as soon as he was free to make her his wife, only she mightn't now be able to bring him anything like the marriage portion of which he had begun by having the virtual promise. Mrs. Mulville let me know what was already said. She was charming, this American girl, but really these American fathers. What was a man to do? Mr. Saltram, according to Mrs. Mulville, was of opinion that a man was never to suffer his relation to money to become a spiritual relation. He was to keep it exclusively material. Moi pas comprendre, I commented on this, in rejoinder to which Adelaide, with her beautiful sympathy, explained that she supposed he simply meant that the thing was to use it, don't you know, but not to think too much about it, to take it, but not to thank you for it. I still more profanely inquired. For a quarter of an hour afterwards she wouldn't look at me, but this didn't prevent my asking her what had been the result this afternoon in Regent's Park of her taking our friend to see Miss Anvoy. Oh, so charming, she answered, brightening. He said he recognized in her a nature he could absolutely trust. Yes, but I'm speaking of the effect on herself. Mrs. Mulville had to remount the stream. It was everything one could wish. Something in her tone made me laugh. Do you mean she gave him a dole? Well, since you ask me... Right there on the spot... Again, poor Adelaide faltered. It was to me, of course, she gave it. I stared. Somehow I couldn't see the scene. Do you mean a sum of money? It was very handsome. Now at least she met my eyes, though I could see it was with an effort. Thirty pounds. Straight out of her pocket? Out of the drawer of a table at which she had been writing. She just slipped the folded notes into my hand. He wasn't looking, 
it was while he was going back to the carriage oh said adelaide reassuringly i take care of it for him the dear practical soul thought my agitation for i confess i was agitated referred to the employment of the money her disclosures made me for a moment muse violently and i dare say that during that moment i wondered if anything else in the world makes people so gross as unselfishness i uttered i suppose some vague synthetic cry for she went on as if she had had a glimpse of my inward amaze at such passages i assure you my dear friend he was in one of his happy hours but i wasn't thinking of that truly indeed these americans i said with her father in the very act as it were of swindling her betrothed mrs mulville stared oh i suppose mr anvoy has scarcely gone bankrupt or whatever he has done on purpose very likely they won't be able to keep it up but there it was and it was a very beautiful impulse you say saltram was very fine beyond everything he surprised even me and i know what you've enjoyed after a moment i added had he peradventure caught a glimpse of the money in the table drawer at this my companion honestly flushed how can you be so cruel when you know how little he calculates forgive me i do know it but you tell me things that act on my nerves i'm sure he hadn't caught a glimpse of anything but some splendid idea mrs mulville brightly concurred and perhaps even of her beautiful listening face perhaps even and what was it all about his talk it was apropos of her engagement which i had told him about the idea of marriage the philosophy the poetry the sublimity of it it was impossible wholly to restrain one's mirth at this and some rude ripple that i admitted again caused my companion to admonish me it sounds a little stale but you know his freshness of illustration indeed i do and how he has always been right on that great question on what great question dear lady hadn't he been right of what other great men can you equally say it and that he has never but never had a deflection mrs mulville exultantly demanded i tried to think of some other great man but i had to give it up uh, didn't miss anvoy express her satisfaction in any less diffident way than by her charming present i was reduced to asking instead oh yes she overflowed to me on the steps while he was getting into the carriage these words somehow brushed up a picture of saltram's big shawled back as he hoisted himself into the green landau she said she wasn't disappointed adelaide pursued i turned it over did he wear his shawl his shawl she hadn't even noticed i mean yours uh he looked very nice and you know he's really clean miss anvoy used such a remarkable expression she said his mind's like a crystal i pricked up my ears a crystal suspended in the moral world swinging and shining and flashing there she's monstrously clever you know i thought again monstrously end of chapter seven recording by larry kaplan chapter eight of the coxon fund by henry james this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by doraline kaplan george gravener didn't follow her for late in september after the house had risen i met him in a railway carriage he was coming up from scotland and i had just quitted some relations who lived near durham the current of travel back to london wasn't yet strong at any rate on entering the compartment i found he had had it for some time to himself we fared in company and though he had a blue book in his lap and the open jaws of his bag threatened me with the white teeth of confused papers we inevitably we even at last sociably conversed i saw things weren't well with him but i asked no question till something dropped by himself made as it had made on another occasion an absence of curiosity invidious he mentioned that he was worried about his good old friend lady coxon 
who, with her niece likely to be detained some time in America, lay seriously ill at Clockborough, much on his mind and on his hands. Ah, Miss Anvoy's in America. Her father has gone into hard straits, has lost no end of money. I waited after expressing due concern, but I eventually said, I hope that raises no objection to your marriage. None whatever. Moreover, it's my trade to meet objections. But it may create tiresome delays, of which there have been too many, from various causes already. Lady Coxon got very bad, then she got much better. Then Mr. Anvoy suddenly began to totter, and now he seems quite on his back. I'm afraid he's really in for some big reverse. Lady Coxon's worse again, awfully upset by the news from America, and she sends me word that she must have Ruth. How can I supply her with Ruth? I haven't got Ruth myself. Surely you haven't lost her? I returned. She's everything to her wretched father. She writes me every post telling me to smooth her aunt's pillow. I have other things to smooth, but the old lady, save for her servants, is really alone. She wouldn't receive her cocks on relation. She's angry at so much of her money going to them. Besides, she's hopelessly mad, said Gravener very frankly. I don't remember whether it was this or what it was that made me ask if she hadn't such an appreciation of Mrs. Saltram as might render that active person of some use. He gave me a cold glance, wanting to know what had put Mrs. Saltram into my head, and I replied that she was unfortunately never out of it. I happened to remember the wonderful account she had given me of the kindness Lady Coxon had shown her. Gravener declared this to be false. Lady Coxon, who didn't care for her, hadn't seen her three times. The only foundation for it was that Miss Anvoy, who used poor girl to chuck money about in a manner she must now regret, had for an hour seen in the miserable woman, you could never know what she'd see in people, an interesting pretext for the liberality with which her nature overflowed. But even Miss Anvoy was now quite tired of her. Gravener told me more about the crash in New York and the annoyance it had been to him, and we also glanced here and there in other directions. But by the time we got to Doncaster, the principal thing he had let me see was that he was keeping something back. We stopped at that station, and at the carriage door, someone made a movement to get in. Gravener uttered a sound of impatience, and I felt sure that but for this, I should have had the secret. Then the intruder, for some reason, spared us his company. We started afresh, and my hope of a disclosure returned. My companion held his tongue, however, and I pretended to go to sleep. In fact, I really dozed for discouragement. When I reopened my eyes, he was looking at me with an injured air. He tossed away with some vivacity the remnant of a cigarette and then said, If you're not too sleepy, I want to put you a case. I answered that I'd make every effort to attend and welcome the note of interest when he went on. As I told you a while ago, Lady Coxon, poor dear, is demented. His tone had much behind it, was full of promise. I asked if her ladyship's misfortune were a trait of her malady or only of her character, and he pronounced it a product of both. The case he wanted to put to me was a matter on which it concerned him to have the impression, the judgment, he might also say, of another person. I mean of the average intelligent man, but you see I take what I can get. There would be the technical the strictly legal view, then there would be the way the question would strike a man of the world. He had lighted another cigarette while he talked, and I saw he was glad to have it to handle when he brought out at last, with a laugh slightly artificial. In fact, it's a subject on which Miss Anvoy and I are pulling different ways. And you want me to decide between you? I decide in advance for Miss Anvoy. In advance, that's quite right. That's how I decided when I proposed to her. But my story will interest you only so far as your mind isn't made up. Gravener puffed his cigarette a minute and then continued. Are you familiar with the idea of the endowment of research? Of research? I was at sea a moment. I give you Lady Coxon's phrase. She has it on the brain. She wishes to endow? Some earnest and loyal seeker, Gravener said. 
It was a sketchy design of her late husband's, and he handed it on to her, setting apart in his will a sum of money of which she was to enjoy the interest for life, but of which she should eventually see her opportunity, the matter was left largely to her discretion, she would best honor his memory by determining the exemplary public use. This sum of money, no less than thirteen thousand pounds, was to be called the Coxon Fund, and poor Sir Gregory evidently proposed to himself that the Coxon Fund should cover his name with glory, be universally desired and admired. He left his wife a full declaration of his views, so far at least as that term may be applied to views vitiated by a vagueness really infantine, a little learning's a dangerous thing. And a good citizen who happens to have been an ass is worse for a community than bad sewerage. He's worst of all when he's dead, because then he can't be stopped. However, such as they were, the poor man's aspirations are now in his wife's bosom, or fermenting rather in her foolish brain. It lies with her to carry them out, but of course she must first catch her hair. Her earnest, loyal seeker? the flower that blushes unseen for want of such a pecuniary independence as may aid the light that's in it to shine upon the human race. The individual, in a word, who, having the rest of the machinery, the spiritual, the intellectual, is most hampered in his search. His search for what? For moral truth, that's what Sir Gregory calls it. I burst out laughing. Delightful, munificent Sir Gregory. It's a charming idea. So Miss Anvoy thinks. Has she a candidate for the fund? Not that I know of, and she's perfectly reasonable about it. But Lady Coxon has put the matter before her, and we've naturally had a lot of talk. Talk that, as you've so interestingly intimated, has landed you in a disagreement. She considers there's something in it, Gravener said. And you consider there's nothing? It seems to me a piece of solemn twaddle which can't fail to be attended with consequences certainly grotesque and possibly immoral. To begin with, fancy constituting an endowment without establishing a tribunal, a bench of competent people, of judges. The sole tribunal is Lady Coxon, and anyone she chooses to invite. But she has invited you. I noted. I'm not competent. I hate the thing. Besides, she hasn't. My friend went on. The real history of the matter, I take it, is that the inspiration was originally Lady Coxon's own, that she infected him with it, and that the flattering option left her is simply his tribute to her beautiful, her aboriginal enthusiasm. She came to England forty years ago, a thin, transcendental Bostonian, and even her odd, happy, frumpy Clockborough marriage never really materialized her. She feels indeed that she has become very British, as if that as a process, as a wordin, as anything but an original sign of grace, were conceivable. But it's precisely what makes her cling to the notion of the fund, cling to it as to a link with the ideal. How can she cling if she's dying? Do you mean how can she act in the matter? Gravener asked. That's precisely the question. She can't. And she has never yet caught her hair, never spied out her lucky impostor. How should she with the life she has led? Her husband's intention has come very near lapsing. His idea, to do him justice, was that it should lapse if exactly the right person, the perfect mixture of genius and chill penury, should fail to turn up. Ah, the poor dear woman's very particular. She says there must be no mistake. I found all this quite thrilling. I took it in with avidity. And if she dies without doing anything, what becomes of the money? I demanded. It goes back to his family, if she hasn't made some other disposition of it. She may do that then, she may divert it. Her hands are not tied, she has a grand discretion. The proof is that three months ago she offered to make the proceeds over to her niece. For Miss Anvoy's own use? For Miss Anvoy's own use, on the occasion of her prospective marriage. She was discouraged, the earnest seeker required so earnest a search. She was afraid of making a mistake. Everyone she could think of seemed either not earnest enough or not poor enough. On the receipt of the first bad news about Mr. Anvoy's affairs, she proposed to Ruth to make the sacrifice for her. As the situation in New York got worse, she repeated her proposal. Which Miss Anvoy declined? Except as a formal trust. You mean except as committing herself legally to place the money? 
on the head of the deserving object, the great man frustrated, said Gravener. She only consents to act in the spirit of Sir Gregory's scheme. And you blame her for that? I asked with some intensity. My tone couldn't have been harsh, but he colored a little, and there was a queer light in his eye. My dear fellow, if I blame the young lady I'm engaged to, I shouldn't immediately say it even to so old a friend as you. I saw that some deep discomfort, some restless desire to be sided with, reassuringly, approvingly mirrored, had been at the bottom of his drifting so far, and I was genuinely touched by his confidence. It was inconsistent with his habits, but being troubled about a woman was not for him a habit. That itself was an inconsistency. George Gravener could stand straight enough before any other combination of forces. It amused me to think that the combination he had succumbed to had an American accent, a transcendental aunt, and an insolvent father. But all my old loyalty to him mustered to meet this unexpected hint that I could help him. I saw that I could from the insincere tone in which he pursued— I've criticized her, of course, I've contended with her, and it has been great fun. Yet it clearly couldn't have been such great fun as to make it improper for me presently to ask if Miss Anvoy had nothing at all settled on herself. To this he replied that she had only a trifle from her mother, a mere four hundred a year, which was exactly why it would be convenient to him that she shouldn't decline in the face of this total change in her prospects and a session of income which would distinctly help them to marry. When I inquired if there were no other way in which so rich and so affectionate an aunt could cause the weight of her benevolence to be felt, he answered that Lady Coxon was affectionate indeed, but was scarcely to be called rich. She could let her project of the fun lapse for her niece's benefit, but she couldn't do anything else. She had been accustomed to regard her as tremendously provided for, and she was up to her eyes in promises to anxious coxons. She was a woman of an inordinate conscience, and her conscience was now a distress to her, hovering around her bed in irreconcilable forms of resentful husbands, portionless nieces, and undiscoverable philosophers. We were by this time getting into the whir of fleeting platforms, the multiplication of lights. I think you'll find, I said with a laugh, that your predicament will disappear in the very fact that the philosopher is undiscoverable. He began to gather up his papers. Who can set a limit to the ingenuity of an extravagant woman? Yes, after all, who indeed? I echoed, as I recall the extravagance commemorated in Adelaide's anecdote of Miss Anvoy and the thirty pounds. End of chapter eight. Recording by Doraline Kaplan. Chapter nine of the Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Kaplan. The thing I had been most sensible of in that talk with George Gravener was the way Saltram's name kept out of it. It seemed to me at the time that we were quite pointedly silent about him, but afterwards it appeared more probable there had been on my companion's part no conscious avoidance. Later on I was sure of this, and for the best of reasons, the simple reason of my perceiving more completely that, for evil as well as for good, he said nothing to Gravener's imagination. That honest man didn't fear him. He was too much disgusted with him. No more did I, doubtless, and for very much the same reason. I treated my friend's story as an absolute confidence. But when before Christmas, by Mrs. Saltram, I was informed of Lady Coxon's death, without having had news of Miss Anvoy's return, I found myself taking for granted we should hear no more of these nuptials, in which, as obscurely unnatural, I now saw I had never too disconcertedly believed. I began to ask myself how people who suited each other so little could please each other so much. The charm was some material charm, some affinity, exquisite doubtless, yet superficial some surrender to youth and beauty and passion, to force and grace and fortune. 
happy accidents, and easy contacts. They might dote on each other's persons, but how could they know each other's souls? How could they have the same prejudices? How could they have the same horizon? Such questions, I confess, seem quenched but not answered when, one day in February, going out to Wimbledon, I found our young lady in the house. A passion that had brought her back across the wintry ocean was as much of a passion as was needed. No impulse equally strong indeed had drawn George Gravener to America, a circumstance on which, however, I reflected only long enough to remind myself that it was none of my business. Ruth Anvoy was distinctly different, and I felt that the difference was not simply that of her marks of mourning. Mrs. Mulville told me soon enough what it was. It was the difference between a handsome girl with large expectations and a handsome girl with only four hundred a year. This explanation, indeed, didn't wholly content me, not even when I learned that her mourning had a double cause— learned that poor Mr. Anvoy, giving way altogether, buried under the ruins of his fortune and leaving next to nothing, had died a few weeks before. "'So she has come out to marry George Gravener,' I commented. "'Wouldn't it have been prettier of him to have saved her the trouble?' "'Hasn't the house just met?' Adelaide replied. "'And for Mr. Gravener the house?' Then she added, "'I gather that her having come is exactly a sign that the marriage is a little shaky.' If it were quite all right, a self-respecting girl like Ruth would have waited for him over there. I noted that there were already Ruth and Adelaide, but what I said was, do you mean she'll have had to return to make it so? No, I mean that she must have come out for some reason independent of it. Adelaide could only surmise, however, as yet, and there was more, as we found, to be revealed. Mrs. Mulville, on hearing of her arrival, had brought the young lady out in the green landau for the Sunday. The Coxons were in possession of the house in Regent's Park, and Miss Anvoy was in dreary lodgings. George Gravener had been with her when Adelaide called, but had assented graciously enough to the little visit at Wimbledon. The carriage, with Mr. Saltram in it, but not mentioned, had been sent off on some errand from which it was to return and pick the ladies up. Gravener had left them together, and at the end of an hour, on the Saturday afternoon, the party of three had driven out to Wimbledon. This was the girl's second glimpse of our great man, and I was interested in asking Mrs. Mulville if the impression made by the first appeared to have been confirmed. On her applying after consideration, that of course with time and opportunity it couldn't fail to be, but that she was disappointed, I was sufficiently struck with her use of this last word to question her further. Do you mean you're disappointed because you judge Miss Anvoy to be? Yes. I hoped for a greater effect last evening. We had two or three people, but he scarcely opened his mouth. He'll be all the better tonight, I opined after a moment. Then I pursued, what particular importance do you attach to the idea of her being impressed? Adelaide turned her mild, pale eyes on me as for rebuke of my levity. Why? the importance of her being as happy as we are. I'm afraid at this my levity grew. Oh, that's a happiness almost too great to wish a person. I saw she hadn't yet in her mind what I had in mine, and at any rate the visitor's actual bliss was limited to a walk in the garden with Kent Mulville. Later in the afternoon I also took one, and I saw nothing of Miss Anvoy till dinner, at which we failed of the company of Saltram, who had caused it to be reported that he was indisposed and lying down. This made us, most of us, for there were other friends present, convey to each other in silence some of the unutterable things that in those years our eyes had inevitably acquired the art of expressing. If a fine little American inquirer hadn't been there, we would have expressed them otherwise, and Adelaide would have pretended not to hear, I had seen her, before the very fact, abstract herself nobly, and I knew that more than once, to keep it from the servants, managing dissimulating cleverly, she had helped her husband to carry him bodily to his room. Just recently he had been so wise and so deep and so high that I had begun to get nervous, to wonder if by chance there was something behind it, if he were kept straight, for instance, by the knowledge that the hated Pudneys would have more to tell us if they chose. He was lying low, but unfortunately it was common wisdom with us in this connection that the biggest splashes took place in the quietest pools. 
we should have had a merry life indeed if all the splashes had sprinkled us as refreshingly as the waters we were even then to feel about our ears. Kent Mulville had been up to his room, but had come back with a face that told as few tales as I had seen it succeed in telling on the evening I waited in the lecture room with Miss Anvoy. I said to myself that our friend had gone out, but it was a comfort that the presence of a comparative stranger deprived us of the dreary duty of suggesting to each other, in respect of his errand, edifying possibilities in which we didn't ourselves believe. At ten o'clock he came into the drawing-room with his waistcoat much awry, but his eyes sending out great signals. It was precisely with his entrance that I ceased to be vividly conscious of him. I saw that the crystal, as I had called it, had begun to swing, and I had need of my immediate attention for Miss Anvoy. Even when I was told afterwards that he had, as we might have said today, broken the record, the manner in which that attention had been rewarded relieved me of a sense of loss. I had, of course, a perfect general consciousness that something great was going on. It was a little like having been etherized to hear Herr Wacom play. The old music was in the air. I felt the strong pulse of thought, the sink and swell, the flight, the poise, the plunge. But I knew something about one of the listeners that nobody else knew, and Saltram's monologue could reach me only through that medium. To this hour I'm of no use when, as a witness, I'm appealed to, for they still absurdly contend about it, as to whether or no on that historic night he was drunk and my position is slightly ridiculous, for I've never cared to tell them what it really was I was taken up with. What I got out of it is the only morsel of the total experience that is quite my own. The others were shared, but this is incommunicable. I feel that now, I'm bound to say, even in thus roughly evoking the occasion, and it takes something from my pride of clearness. However, I shall perhaps be as clear as is absolutely needful, if I remarked that our young lady was too much given up to her own intensity of observation to be sensible of mine. It was plainly not the question of her marriage that had brought her back. I greatly enjoyed this discovery, and was sure that had that question alone been involved, she would have stirred no step. In this case, doubtless, Gravener would, in spite of the House of Commons, have found means to rejoin her. It afterwards made me uncomfortable for her that, alone in the lodging Mrs. Mulville had put before me as dreary, she should have in any degree the air of waiting for her fate, so that I was presently relieved at hearing of her having gone to stay at Coalfield. If she was in England at all while the engagement stood, the only proper place for her was under Lady Maddock's wing. Now that she was unfortunate and relatively poor, perhaps her prospective sister-in-law would be wholly won over. There would be much to say if I had space about the way her behavior, as I caught gleams of it, ministered to the image that had taken birth in my mind, to my private amusement while that other night I listened to George Gravener in the railway carriage. I watched her in the light of this queer possibility, a formidable thing certainly to meet, and I was aware that it colored, extravagantly perhaps, my interpretation of her very looks and tones. At Wimbledon, for instance, it had appeared to me she was literally afraid of Saltram, in dread of a coercion that she had begun already to feel. I had come up to town with her the next day, and had been convinced that, though deeply interested, she was immensely on her guard. She would show as little as possible before she should be ready to show everything. What this final exhibition might be on the part of a girl perceptibly so able to think things out, I found it great sport to forecast. It would have been exciting to be approached by her, appealed to by her for advice, but I prayed to heaven I mightn't find myself in such a predicament. If there was really a present rigor in the situation of which Gravener had sketched for me the elements, she would have to get out of her difficulty by herself. It wasn't I who had launched her, and it wasn't I who could help her. I didn't fail to ask myself why, since I couldn't help her, I should think so much about her. It was in part my suspense that was responsible for this. I waited impatiently to see whether she wouldn't have told Mrs. Mulville, a portion at least, of what I had learned from Gravener. But I saw Mrs. Mulville was still reduced to wonder what she had come out again for if she hadn't come as a conciliatory bride. 
that she had come in some other character was the only thing that fitted all the appearances. Having for family reasons to spend some time that spring in the west of England, I was in a manner out of the earshot of the great oceanic rumble, I mean of the continuous hum of Saltram's thought, and my uneasiness tended to keep me quiet. There was something I wanted so little to have to say that my prudence surmounted my curiosity. I only wondered if Ruth Anvoy talked over the idea of the Coxon Fund with Lady Maddock, and also, somewhat, why I didn't hear from Wimbledon. I had a reproachful note about something or other from Mrs. Saltram, but it contained no mention of Lady Coxon's niece, on whom her eyes had been much less fixed since the recent untoward events. End of chapter 9 Recording by Larry Kaplan Chapter 10 of the Coxon Fund by Henry James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Doraline Kaplan Poor Adelaide's silence was fully explained later, practically explained when in June, returning to London, I was honored by this admirable woman with an early visit. As soon as she arrived, I guessed everything, and as soon as she told me that darling Ruth had been in her house nearly a month, I had my question ready. What in the name of maidenly modesty is she staying in England for? Because she loves me so, cried Adelaide gaily. But she hadn't come to see me only to tell me Miss Anvoy loved her. That was quite sufficiently established, and what was much more to the point was that Mr. Gravener had now raised an objection to it. He had protested at least against her being at Wimbledon, where in the innocence of his heart he had originally brought her himself. He called on her to put an end to their engagement in the only proper, the only happy manner. And why in the world doesn't she do do? I asked. Adelaide had a pause. She says you know. Then am I also hesitating, she added, a condition he makes. The Coxon Fund? I panted. He has mentioned to her his having told you about it. Ah, but so little. Do you mean she has accepted the trust? In the most splendid spirit, as a duty about which there can be no two opinions, to which my friend added, of course, she's thinking of Mr. Saltram. I gave a quick cry at this, which in its violence made my visitor turn pale. How very awful! Awful? Why, to have anything to do with such an idea oneself? I'm sure you needn't. And Mrs. Mulville tossed her head. He isn't good enough. I went on, to which she opposed a sound almost as contentious as my own had been. This made me, with genuine immediate horror, exclaim. You haven't influenced her, I hope. And my emphasis brought back the blood with a rush to poor Adelaide's face. She declared while she blushed, for I had frightened her again, that she had never influenced anybody, and that the girl had only seen and heard and judged for herself. He had influenced her, if I would, as he did everyone who had a soul. That word, as we knew, even expressed feebly the power of the things he said to haunt the mind. How could she, Adelaide, help it if Miss Anvoy's mind was haunted? I demanded with a groan what right a pretty girl engaged to a rising M.P. had to have a mind. But the only explanation my bewildered friend could give me was that she was so clever. She regarded Mr. Saltram naturally as a tremendous force for good. She was intelligent enough to understand him and generous enough to admire. She's many things enough, but is she among them rich enough? I demanded. Rich enough, I mean, to sacrifice such a lot of good money? That's for herself to judge. Besides, it's not her own money. She doesn't in the least consider it so. And Gravener does, if not his own, and that's the whole difficulty? The difficulty that brought her back, yes. She had absolutely to see her poor aunt's solicitor. It's clear that by Lady Coxon's will she may have the money but it's still clear to her conscience that the original condition, definite, intensely implied on her uncle's part, is attached to the use of it. She can only take one view of it. It's for the endowment, or it's for nothing. 
The endowment, I permitted myself to observe, is a conception superficially sublime, but fundamentally ridiculous. Are you repeating Mr. Gravener's words? Adelaide asked. Possibly, though I've not seen him for months. It's simply the way it strikes me, too. It's an old wives' tale. Gravener made some reference to the legal aspect, but such an absurdly loose arrangement has no legal aspect. Ruth doesn't insist on that, said Mrs. Mulville, and it's, for her, exactly this technical weakness that constitutes the force of the moral obligation. Are you repeating her words? I inquired. I forget what else Adelaide said, but she said she was magnificent. I thought of George Gravener confronted with such magnificence as that, and I asked what could have made two such persons ever suppose they understood each other. Mrs. Mulville assured me the girl loved him as such a woman could love, and that she suffered as such a woman could suffer. Nevertheless, she wanted to see me. At this I sprang up with a groan. Oh, I'm so sorry. When? Small though her sense of humor, I think Adelaide laughed at my sequence. We discussed the day, the nearest it would be convenient I should come out. But before she went, I asked my visitor how long she had been acquainted with these prodigies. For several weeks, but I was pledged to secrecy. And that's why you didn't write? I couldn't very well tell you she was with me without telling you that no time had even yet been fixed for her marriage. And I couldn't very well tell you as much as that without telling you what I knew of the reason of it. It was not till a day or two ago, Mrs. Melville went on, that she asked me to ask you if you wouldn't come and see her. Then at last she spoke of your knowing about the idea of the endowment. I turned this over. Why on earth does she want to see me? To talk with you, naturally, about Mr. Saltram. As a subject for the prize? This was hugely obvious, and I presently returned. I think I'll sail tomorrow for Australia. Well, then, sail, said Mrs. Mulville, getting up. But I frivolously continued. On Thursday at five, we said? The appointment was made definite, and I inquired how, all this time, the unconscious candidate had carried himself. In perfection, really, by the happiest of chances, is positively been a dear. And then, as to what we revere him for in the most wonderful form, his very highest, pure celestial light. You won't do him an ill turn, Adelaide pleaded at the door. What danger can equal for him the danger to which he's exposed for himself? I asked. Look out sharp, if he has lately been too prim. He'll presently take a day off, treat us to some exhibition that will make an endowment a scandal. A scandal? Mrs. Mulville dolorously echoed. Is Miss Anvoy prepared for that? My visitor for a moment screwed her parasol into my carpet. He grows bigger every day. So do you. I laughed as she went off. That girl at Wimbledon on the Thursday afternoon more than justified my apprehensions. I recognized fully now the cause of the agitation she had produced in me from the first the faint foreknowledge that there was something very stiff I should have to do for her. I felt more than ever committed to my fate as, standing before her in the big drawing room where they had tactfully left us to ourselves, I tried with a smile to string together the pearls of lucidity which from her chair she successively tossed me. Pale and bright in her monotonous mourning, she was an image of intelligent purpose, of the passion of duty, but I asked myself whether any girl had ever had so charming an instinct as that which permitted her to laugh out, as for the joy of her difficulty, into the priggish old room. This remarkable young woman could be earnest without being solemn, and at moments when I ought doubtless to have cursed her obstinacy, I found myself watching the unstudied play of her eyebrows, or the recurrence of a singularly intense whiteness produced by the parting of her lips. These aberrations, I hasten to add, didn't prevent my learning soon enough why she had wished to see me. Her reason for this was as distinct as her beauty. It was to make me explain what I had meant on the occasion of our first meeting, 
by Mr. Saltram's want of dignity. It wasn't that she couldn't imagine, but she desired it there from my lips. What she really desired, of course, was to know whether there was worse about him than what she had found out for herself. She hadn't been a month so much in the house with him without discovering that he wasn't a man of monumental bronze. He was like a jelly minus its mold. He had to be embanked, and that was precisely the source of her interest in him and the ground of her project. She put her project boldly before me. There it stood in its preposterous beauty. She was as willing to take the humorous view of it as I could be. The only difference was that for her, the humorous view of a thing wasn't necessarily prohibitive, wasn't paralyzing. Moreover, she professed that she couldn't discuss with me the primary question, the moral obligation. That was in her own breast. There were things she couldn't go into, injunctions, impressions she had received. They were a part of the closest intimacy of her intercourse with her aunt. They were absolutely clear to her, and on questions of delicacy, the interpretation of a fidelity, of a promise, one had always in the last resort to make up one's mind for one's self. It was the idea of the application to the particular case, such a splendid one at last, that troubled her, and she admitted that it stirred very deep things. She didn't pretend that such a responsibility was a simple matter. If it had been, she wouldn't have attempted to saddle me with any portion of it. The Mulvilles were sympathy itself, but were they absolutely candid? Could they indeed be in their position? Would it even have been to be desired? Yes, she had sent for me to ask no less than that of me, whether there was anything dreadful kept back. She made no allusion whatever to George Gravener. I thought her silence the only good taste and her gaiety perhaps a part of the very anxiety of that discretion, the effect of a determination that people shouldn't know from herself that her relations with the man she was to marry were strained. All the weight, however, that she had left me to throw was a sufficient implication of the weight he had thrown in vain. Oh, she knew the question of character was immense, and that one couldn't entertain any plan for making merit comfortable without running the gauntlet of that terrible procession of interrogation points which, like a young lady's school out for a walk, hooked their uniform noses at the tail of governess conduct. But were we absolutely to hold that there was never, never, never an exception, never, never, never an occasion for liberal acceptance, for clever charity, for suspended penitry, for letting one side, in short, outbalance another? When Miss Anvoy threw off this appeal, I could have embraced her for so delightfully emphasizing her unlikeness to Mrs. Saltram. Why not have the courage of one's forgiveness, she asked, as well as the enthusiasm of one's adhesion? Seeing how wonderfully you've threshed the whole thing out, I evasively replied, gives me an extraordinary notion of the point your enthusiasm has reached. She considered this remark an instant with her eyes on mine, and I divined that it struck her I might possibly intend it as a reference to some personal subjection to our fat philosopher, to some aberration of sensibility, some perversion of taste. At least I couldn't interpret otherwise the sudden flash that came into her face. Such a manifestation as a result of any word of mine embarrassed me, but while I was thinking how to reassure her, the flush passed away and a smile of exquisite good nature. Oh, you see, one forgets so wonderfully how one dislikes him, she said, and if her tone simply extinguished this strange figure with a brush of its compassion, it also rings in my ear today as the purest of all our praises. But with what quick response of fine pity such a relegation of the man himself made me privately sigh, Ah, uh, poor Saltram. She instantly, with this, took the measure of all I didn't believe, and it enabled her to go on. What can one do when a person had given such a lift to one's interest in life? 
Yes, what can one do? If I struck her as a little vague, it was because I was thinking of another person. I indulged in another inarticulate murmur. Poor George Gravener. What had become of the lift he had given that interest? Later on, I made up my mind that she was sore and stricken at the appearance he presented of wanting the miserable money. This was the hidden reason of her alienation, the probable sincerity, in spite of the illiberality of his scruples about the particular use of it under discussion, didn't efface the ugliness of his demand that they should buy a good house with it. Then, as for his alienation, he didn't, pardonably enough, grasp the lift Frank Saltram had given her interest in life. If a mere spectator could ask that last question, with what rage in his heart the man himself might. He wasn't like her, I was to see, too proud to show me why he was disappointed. End of chapter 10 Recording by Doralene Kaplan Chapter 11 of the Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Kaplan. I was unable this time to stay to dinner. Such, at any rate, was the plea on which I took leave. I desired, in truth, to get away from my young lady, for that obviously helped me not to pretend to satisfy her. How could I satisfy her? I asked myself, how could I tell her how much had been kept back? I didn't even know, and I certainly didn't desire to know. My own policy had ever been to learn the least about poor Saltram's weaknesses, not to learn the most. A great deal that I had in fact learned had been forced upon me by his wife. There was something even irritating in Miss Anvoy's crude conscientiousness, and I wondered why, after all, she couldn't have let him alone and been content to entrust George Gravener with the purchase of the good house." I was sure he would have driven a bargain, got something excellent and cheap. I laughed louder than she. I temporized. I failed her. I told her I must think over her case. I professed a horror of responsibilities and twitted her with her own extravagant passion for them. It wasn't really that I was afraid of the scandal, the moral discredit for the fund. What troubled me most was a feeling of a different order. Of course, as the beneficiary of the fund was to enjoy a simple life interest, as it was hoped that new beneficiaries would arise and come up to new standards, it wouldn't be a trifle that the first of these worthies shouldn't have been a striking example of the domestic virtues. The fund would start badly, as it were, and the laurel would, in some respects at least, scarcely be greener from the brows of the original wearer. That idea, however, was at that hour, as I have hinted, not the source of solicitude it ought perhaps to have been, for I felt less the irregularity of Saltram's getting the money than that of this exalted young woman's giving it up. I wanted her to have it for herself, and I told her so before I went away. She looked graver at this than she had looked at all, saying she hoped such a preference wouldn't make me dishonest. It made me, to begin with, very restless made me, instead of going straight to the station, fidget a little about that many-colored common which gives Wimbledon horizons. There was a worry for me to work off, or rather keep at a distance, for I declined even to admit to myself that I had, in Miss Anvoy's phrase, been saddled with it. What could have been clear indeed than the attitude of recognizing perfectly what a world of trouble the Coxon Fund would in future save us, and of yet liking better to face a continuance of that trouble than see, and in fact contribute to, a deviation from attainable bliss in the life of two other persons in whom I was deeply interested? Suddenly, at the end of twenty minutes, there was projected across this clearness the image of a massive middle-aged man seated on a bench under a tree, with sad, far-wandering eyes, and plump white hands folded on the head of a stick, a stick I recognized, a stout, gold-headed staff that I had given him in devoted days. I stopped short as he turned his face to me, and it happened that for some reason or other I took in, as I had perhaps never done before, the beauty of his rich, blank gaze. It was charged with experience as the sky is charged with light, and I felt on the instant as if we had been overspanned and conjoined by the great arch of a bridge 
or the great dome of a temple. Doubtless I was rendered peculiarly sensitive to it by something in the way I had been giving him up and sinking him. While I met it, I stood there smitten, and I felt myself responding to it with a sort of guilty grimace. This brought back his attention in a smile which expressed for me a cheerful, weary patience, a bruised noble gentleness. I had told Miss Anvoy that he had no dignity, but what did he seem to me, all unbuttoned and fatigued as he waited for me to come up, if he didn't seem unconcerned with small things? Didn't seem, in short, majestic? There was majesty in his mere unconsciousness of our little conferences and puzzlements over his maintenance and his reward. After I had sat by him a few minutes, I passed my arm over his big, soft shoulder. Wherever you touched him, you found equally little firmness, and said in a tone of which the suppliance fell oddly on my own ear, Come back to town with me, old friend. Come back and spend the evening. I wanted to hold him. I wanted to keep him, and at Waterloo, an hour later, I telegraphed possessively to the Mulvilles. When he objected, as regards staying all night, that he had no things, I asked him if he hadn't everything of mine. I'd abstained from ordering dinner, and it was too late for preliminaries at a club, so we were reduced to tea and fried fish at my rooms, reduced also to the transcendent. Something had come up which made me want him to feel at peace with me, and which, precisely, was all the dear man himself wanted on any occasion. I had too often had to press upon him considerations irrelevant, but it gives me pleasure now to think that on that particular evening I didn't even mention Mrs. Saltram and the children. Late into the night we smoked and talked. Old shames and old rigors fell away from us. I only let him see that I was conscious of what I owed him. He was as mild as contrition and as copious as faith. He was never so fine as on a shy return and even better at forgiving than at being forgiven. I dare say it was a smaller matter than that famous night at Wimbledon, the night of the problematical sobriety and of Miss Anvoy's initiation. But I was as much in it on this occasion as I had been out of it then. At about one-thirty he was sublime. He never, in whatever situation, rose till all other risings were over, and his breakfasts at Wimbledon had always been the principal reason mentioned by departing cooks. The coast was therefore clear for me to receive her when, early the next morning, to my surprise, it was announced to me his wife had called. I hesitated, after she had come up, about telling her Saltram was in the house, but she herself settled the question, kept me reticent by drawing forth a sealed letter which, looking at me very hard in the eyes, she placed, with a pregnant absence of comment, in my hand. For a single moment there glimmered before me the fond hope that Mrs. Saltram had tendered me, as it were, her resignation and desired to embody the act in an unsparing form. To bring this about I would have feigned any humiliation, but after my eyes had caught the superscription, I heard myself say with a flatness that betrayed a sense of something very different from relief, Oh, the Pudneys! I knew their envelopes, though they didn't know mine. They always used the kind sold at post offices with a stamp affixed, and as this letter hadn't been posted, they had wasted a penny on me. I had seen their horrid missives to the Mulvilles, but hadn't been in direct correspondence with them. They enclosed it to me to be delivered. They doubtless explained to you that they hadn't your address. I turned the thing over without opening it. Why in the world should they write to me? Because they've something to tell you. The worst, Mrs. Saltram dryly added. It was another chapter, I felt, of the history of the lamentable quarrel with her husband, the episode in which, vindictively, disingenuously as they themselves had behaved, one had to admit that he had put himself more grossly in the wrong than at any moment of his life. He had begun by insulting the matchless Mulvilles for these more specious protectors, and then, according to his want at the end of a few months, had dug a still deeper ditch for his aberration than the chasm left yawning behind. The chasm as Wimbledon was now blessedly closed, but the Pudneys, across their persistent gulf, kept up the nastiest fire. I never doubted that they had a strong case, and I had been from the first for not defending him, reasoning that if they weren't contradicted, they'd perhaps subside. 
This was above all what I wanted, and I so far prevailed that I did arrest the correspondence in time to save our little circle an infliction heavier than it perhaps would have borne. I knew, that as I divined, that their allegations had gone as yet only as far as their courage, conscious as they were, in their own virtue of an exposed place in which Saltram could have planted a blow. It was a question with them whether a man who had himself so much to cover up would dare his blow, so that these vessels of rancor were in a manner afraid of each other. I judged that on the day the Pudney should cease for some reason or other to be afraid they would treat us to some revelation more disconcerting than any of its predecessors. As I held Mrs. Saltram's letter in my hand, it was distinctly communicated to me that the day had come. They had ceased to be afraid. I don't want to know the worst, I presently declared. You'll have to open the letter. It also contains an enclosure. I felt it. It was fat and uncanny. Wheels within wheels, I exclaimed. There's something for me, too, to deliver. So they tell me. To Miss Anvoy. I stared. I felt a certain thrill. Why don't they send it to her directly? Mrs. Saltram hung fire. Because she's staying with Mr. and Mrs. Mulville. And why should that prevent? Again my visitor faltered, and I began to reflect on the grotesque, the unconscious perversity of her action. I was the only person, save George Gravener and the Mulvilles, who was aware of Sir Gregory Coxon's and of Miss Anvoy's strange bounty. Where could there have been a more signal illustration of the clumsiness of human affairs than her having complacently selected this moment to fly in the face of it? There's the chance of their seeing her letters. They know Mr. Pudney's hand. Still I didn't understand. Then it flashed upon me. You mean they might intercept it? How can you imply anything so base? I indignantly demanded. It's not I. It's Mr. Pudney, cried Mrs. Saltram with a flush. It's his own idea. Then why couldn't he send the letter to you to be delivered? Mrs. Saltram's embarrassment increased. She gave me another hard look. You must make that out for yourself. I made it out quickly enough. It's a denunciation? A real lady doesn't betray her husband, this virtuous woman exclaimed. I burst out laughing, and I fear my laugh may have had an effect of impertinence especially to Miss Anvoy, who so easily shocked. Why do such things concern her? I asked, much at a loss. Because she's there, exposed to all his craft. Mr. and Mrs. Pudney have been watching this. They feel she may be taken in. Thank you for all the rest of us. What difference can it make when she has lost her power to contribute? Again, Mrs. Saltram considered, then very nobly, There are other things in the world than money. This hadn't occurred to her so long as the young lady had any, but she now added, with a glance at my letter, that Mr. and Mrs. Pudney doubtless explained their motives. It's all in kindness, she continued as she got up. Kindness to Miss Anvoy? You took on the whole another view of kindness before her reverses. My companion smiled with some acidity. Perhaps you're no safer than the Mulvilles. I didn't want her to think that, nor that she should report to the Pudneys that they had not been happy in their agent, and I well remember that this was the moment at which I began, with considerable emotion, to promise myself to enjoin upon Miss Anvoy never to open any letter that should come to her in one of those penny envelopes. My emotion, and I fear I must add my confusion, quickly deepened. I presently should have been as glad to frighten Mrs. Saltram as to think I might by some diplomacy restore the Pudneys to acquire a vigilance. It's best you should take my view of my safety, I at any rate soon responded. When I saw she didn't know what I meant by this, I added, you may turn out to have done, in bringing me this letter, a thing you'll profoundly regret. My tone had a significance which, I could see, did make her uneasy, and there was a moment, after I had made two or three more remarks of studiously bewildering effect, at which her eyes followed so hungrily the little flourish of the letter, with which I emphasized them that I instinctively slipped Mr. Pudney's communication into my pocket. She looked, in her embarrassed annoyance, capable of grabbing it to send it back to him. I felt, after she had gone, as if I had almost given her my word I wouldn't deliver the enclosure. The passionate movement, at any rate, 
with which in solitude I transferred the whole thing unopened from my pocket to a drawer which I double-locked would have amounted, for an initiated observer, to some such pledge. End of chapter 11. Recording by Larry Kaplan. Chapter 12 of The Coxon Fund by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Doreen Kaplan. Mrs. Saltram left me drawing my breath more quickly, and indeed almost in pain, as if I had just perilously grazed the loss of something precious. I didn't quite know what it was. It had a shocking resemblance to my honor. The emotion was the livelier, surely, in that my pulses even yet vibrated to the pleasure with which, the night before, I had rallied to the rare analyst, the great intellectual adventurer and pathfinder. What had dropped from me like a cumbersome garment, as Saltram appeared before me in the afternoon on the heath, was the disposition to haggle over his value. Hang it! One had to choose, one had to put that value somewhere, so I would put it really high and have done with it. Mrs. Mulville drove in for him at a discreet hour, the earliest she could suppose him to have got up, and I learned that Miss Anvoy would also have come had she not been expecting a visit from Mr. Gravener. I was perfectly mindful that I was under bonds to see this young lady, and also that I had a letter to hand to her but I took my time. I waited from day to day. I left Mrs. Saltram to deal as her apprehension should prompt with the Pudneys. I knew at last what I meant. I had ceased to wince at my responsibility. I gave this supreme impression of Saltram time to fade if it would, but it didn't fade, and individually it hasn't faded even now. During the month that I thus invited myself to stiffen again, Adelaide Mulville, perplexed by my absence, wrote to me to ask why I was so stiff. At that season of the year, I was usually oftener with them. She also wrote that she feared a real estrangement had set in between Mr. Gravener and her sweet young friend, a state of things but half satisfactory to her, so long as the advantage resulting to Mr. Saltram failed to disengage itself from the merely nebulous state. She intimated that her sweet young friend was, if anything, a trifle too reserved. She also intimated that there might now be an opening for another clever young man. There never was the slightest opening, I may here parenthesize, and of course the question can't come up today. These are all frustrations now. Ruth Anvoy hasn't married, I hear, and neither have I. During the month, toward the end, I wrote to George Gravener to ask if, on a special errand, I might come to see him, and his answer was to knock the very next day at my door. I saw he had immediately connected my inquiry with the talk we had had in the railway carriage, and his promptitude showed that the ashes of his eagerness weren't yet cold. I told him there was something I felt I ought in candor to let him know. I recognized the obligation— his friendly confidence had laid on me. "'You mean Miss Anvoy has talked to you? She has told me so herself,' he said. "'It wasn't to tell you so that I wanted to see you,' I replied, "'for it seemed to me that such a communication would rest wholly with herself. If, however, she did speak to you of our conversation, she probably told you I was discouraging. Discouraging? On the subject of a present application of the Coxon Fund. To the case of Mr. Salter? My dear fellow, I don't know what you call discouraging. Gravener cried. Well, I thought I was, and I thought she thought I was. I believe she did, but such a thing's measured by the effect. She's not discouraged. He said. That's her own affair. The reason I asked you to see me was that it appeared to me I ought to tell you frankly that, decidedly, I can't undertake to produce that effect. In fact, I don't want to. It's very good of you, damn you. My visitor laughed, red and really grave. Then he said, You'd like to see that scoundrel publicly glorified, perched on the pedestal of a great complimentary pension? 
I braced myself. Taking one form of public recognition with another, it seems to me, on the whole, I should be able to bear it. When I see the compliments that are paid right and left, I ask myself why this one shouldn't take its course. This, therefore, is what you're entitled to have looked to me to mention to you. I have some evidence that perhaps would be really dissuasive, but I propose to invite Miss Anvoy to remain in ignorance of it. And to invite me to do the same? Oh, you don't require it. You've evidence enough. I speak of a sealed letter that I've been requested to deliver to her. And you don't mean to? There's only one consideration that would make me. I said. Gravener's clear, handsome eyes plunged into mine a minute but evidently without fishing up a clue to this motive, a failure by which I was almost wounded. What does this letter contain? It's sealed, as I tell you, and I don't know what it contains. Why is it sent through you, rather than you? I wondered how to put the thing. The only explanation I can think of is that the person sending it may have imagined your relations with Miss Anvoy to be at an end, may have been told this is the case by Mrs. Saltram. My relation with Miss Anvoy are not at an end. Poor Gravener stammered. Again for an instant I thought. The offer I propose to make you gives me the right to address you a question remarkably direct. Are you still engaged to Miss Anvoy? No, I'm not. He slowly brought out. But we're perfectly good friends. Such good friends that you'll again become prospective husband and wife if the obstacle in your path be removed? Removed? he anxiously repeated. If I send Miss Anvoy the letter I speak of, she may give up her idea. Then for God's sake, send it! I'll do so if you're ready to assure me that her sacrifice would now presumably bring about your marriage. I'd marry her the next day! my visitor cried. Yes, but would she marry you? What I ask of you, of course, is nothing less than your word of honor as to your conviction of this. If you give it to me, I said, I'll engage to hand her the letter before night. Gravener took up his hat. Turning it mechanically round, he stood looking a moment hard at its unruffled perfection. Then very angrily, honestly, and gallantly, Hand it to the devil, he broke out, with which he clapped the hat on his head and left me. Will you read it or not? I said to Ruth Anvoy at Wimbledon, when I had told her the story of Mrs. Saltram's visit. She debated for a time, probably of the briefest, but long enough to make me nervous. Have you brought it with you? No, indeed, it's at home, locked up. There was another great silence, and then she said, Go back and destroy it. I went back, but I didn't destroy it till after Saltram's death, when I burnt it unread. The Pudneys approached her again pressingly, but prompt as they were, the Coxon Fund had already become an operative benefit and a general amaze. Mr. Saltram, while we gathered about, as it were, to watch the manna descend, had begun to draw the magnificent income. He drew it as he had always drawn everything, with a grand, abstracted gesture. Its magnificence, alas, as all the world now knows, quite quenched him. It was the beginning of his decline. It was also naturally a new grievance for his wife, who began to believe in him as soon as he was blighted, and who at this hour accuses us of having bribed him on the whim of a meddlesome American to renounce his glorious office, to become, as she says, like everybody else. The very day he found himself able to publish, he wholly ceased to produce— this deprived us, as may easily be imagined, of much of our occupation, and especially deprived the Mulvilles, whose want of self-support I never measured till they lost their great inmate. They've no one to live on now. Adelaide's most frequent reference to their destitution is embodied in the remark that dear, faraway Ruth's intentions were doubtless good. She and Kent are even yet looking for another prop, but no one presents a true sphere of usefulness. They complain that people are self-sufficing. With Saltram, the fine type of the child of adoption was scattered, the grander, the elder style. They've got their carriage back, but what's an empty carriage? 
In short, I think we were all happier as well as poorer before, even including George Gravener, who by the deaths of his brother and his nephew has lately become Lord Maddock. His wife, whose fortune clears the property, is criminally dull. He hates being in the upper house and hasn't yet had high office. But what are these accidents, which I should perhaps apologize for mentioning, in the light of the great eventual boon promised the patient by the rate at which the Coxon Fund must be rolling up? End of chapter 12. Recording by Dorlene Kaplan. End of the Coxon Fund by Henry James.